imagine that you could go to the store, buy groceries, eat out in restaurants, pay your rent, and buy automobiles and furniture simply by writing an IOU uh, to the sellers. Uh, people can't do this in practice uh, because nobody would accept uh, your IOUs. Or if they did accept them, uh, as banks do when they make a loan agreement, you have to sign uh, a contract with them and they have legal recourse to take your income uh, or your wages and take your property uh, if you sign uh, for any of the IOUs that you make. But uh, imagine there's no recourse. What if uh, the grocery store and the uh, other merchandise sellers just keep your IOUs and then uh, they pay their suppliers in part with your IOUs and so on. And uh, your IOUs somehow get into circulation uh, and everybody can use them as money as if it were real money. Well, metaphorically speaking, that's uh, just what the United States does in international uh, affairs. Uh, its IOUs are US Treasury securities, promises to pay. A Treasury bond or a deposit with the US Treasury is a Treasury IOU. Uh, but the recipients don't have any real recourse to enforce payment. What are they going to do to get an equivalent value of uh, all these dollars uh, that they uh, are ending up with in their central banks? What can they do with these dollars? They can't do with them much more than uh, the grocery store could do with an IOU uh, that you give them. Uh, they can't buy the commanding heights of the US economy. Uh, China's been blocked from buying important information technology companies, as you know. Uh, OPEC countries also have been told that they cannot buy uh, any important uh, companies. They can buy US stocks and US bonds as junior partners, but they can't have any real say in using their surplus dollars that they get for their oil exports to obtain any control over uh, vital US ass uh, assets. So the question is, how did it come that the United States can get away with this? If other countries uh, uh, sign an IOU, borrow from the IMF, borrow from bondholders, the bondholders get to foreclose. They get to grab the assets of other countries as Paul Singer's uh, vulture fund tried to grab uh, Argentina's uh, boats and other assets uh, outside of Argentina. And as the United States is trying to grab uh, Venezuela's uh, oil uh, distribution in the US. Uh, but other countries can't do that to the United States. So uh, the answer is that America has a unique form of international economic control. And that uh, form is financial. Uh, it no longer needs to conquer countries militarily. Uh, it did invade Iraq in 2003, uh, but usually it's uh, much less expensive simply to use financial control uh, of the international monetary system. And that control enables the United States to spend over $1 trillion annually uh, to back its dominance by the military industrial complex. Uh, military operations around the world with more than 800 military bases that would bankrupt uh, the end. Uh, any other uh, nation and force any other country doing what the United States does militarily to devalue its currency. Now, my book, Super Imperialism, describes how US diplomacy gained power after World War I uh, by demanding that the allies, England, France, and the other allies in the war, uh, uh, pay for their arms that they had bought on credit prior to America's entry into the conflict. Europe's agreement to pay crashed its economies in the 1920s. And that led to the Great Depression in the 30s and ultimately to a new war buildup that led uh, to capital flight to the United States and everybody wanted to uh, avoid World War II that they saw coming largely because their financial system was bankrupted by America's creditor demands uh, to be paid uh, by the allies who turned around and insisted reparations from Germany so that they could pay the United States. So that by the time uh, uh, the United States uh, re recovered from the war in 1950, the US Treasury had nearly three quarters of the world's monetary gold. This monopoly opposition on gold and the entire financial system of countries was based on gold. How much of a budget deficit uh, they could run, how much money they could print. Things changed in 1950. For the first time, the United States dollar moved into balance of payments deficit. 
And that was because the Korean War and subsequent military spending in Vietnam and uh, Southeast Asia pushed the United States into deepening deficit that finally, uh, two decades later, forced the dollar off gold in 1971. Now, what was unique and what I'm going to talk about today is how US diplomacy was able to turn the tables and it could retain the financial domination of the world economy, even though it no longer uh, paid its uh, deficits in gold. Uh, it became the world's largest debtor. And uh, since 19, 71, the United States has dominated other countries and the, the global monetary system by, by being a debtor, not a creditor. And this paper gold dollars, sort of like paper tiger, paper gold, the dollars that the US government and private investors spend abroad, uh, mainly to cover the cost of military encirclement of the world, uh, and also uh, uh, it become the, uh, bank, the reserves of foreign central banks. These dollars that America spends on its military bases all over the world end up in the central banks of uh, uh, Germany, France, China, Russia, countries running uh, balance of payment surpluses. Uh, and uh, they're, they're stuck with these dollars. Uh, the dollars of, of their central bank reserves under the dollar standard and the treasury bill standard that America put in place in 1971, their savings are the money that America spends militarily around the world, both to encircle them and to buy up uh, their economies. Uh, so they're giving the United States a, a free lunch of a kind that no other country has ever got in history, except by military occupation and military tribute. So even though the US economy is spending more dollars to buy the industrial products that it no longer produces, because it's in deindustrializing, uh, it, pro it proclaims itself the world's indispensable country. Uh, the United States is exceptional in not having to pay uh, the dollar debts that it runs up at, uh, at will without any limit. When other countries run deeply into debt, the IMF and bondholders bring financial pressures to bear and they dictate that uh, economies have to uh, follow uh, what the creditors tell them to do. Uh, but the United States enjoys a fortunate position akin to what uh, that of classical Athens that we described in lecture two last week. Athens was able to buy expensive um, trireme ships for its navy, hire mercenaries, and support military allies with silver coinage minted from its own silver mines in Lorient. So it could produce its own money to spend abroad. It didn't have to run a uh, a balance of payment surplus or a trade surplus. Uh, and the Athenian silver coinage, the owls, became the silver monetary standard of the fifth century BC. Now, today, although the United States doesn't have to produce uh, physical silver or gold to pay uh, its allies or other countries, it can simply print the IOUs that I described uh, abroad, uh, uh, to spend abroad. And unlike the foreign debt of other countries, nobody expects the United States actually to pay off these IOUs. And in fact, there's no foreseeable way in which they can be paid. So the United States enjoys a fortunate position uh, akin to that of classical uh, uh, Athens uh, that I described. There's no, uh, be and basically the only way to stop uh, letting the United States spend these uh, dollars is to de-dollarize so that they can extricate themselves from the dollar standard. Uh, and in addition to their disagreeing with the aims for uh, dollar diplomacy and uh, that are financed by the treasury gold standard. That's the only way to stop funding the US military encirclement uh, of their territory and to stop permitting uh, US investors to spend the dollar credit to buy up uh, their industry. Now, be before, uh, before World War I, uh, I'm going to now walk through uh, uh, historically how the system developed and uh, what kind of a turnaround. And uh, the basic theme of this lecture is we've discussed finance capitalism uh, in the last uh, two lectures. State capitalist imperialism is somewhat different from uh, uh, private sector finance capitalism. Uh, it, the aims of a state are of the United States and world military power actually end up shrinking the economy uh, and are 
not only destructive of industrial capitalism, but they're not even in the interests of private bankers. They're in the interest of government uh, and Cold War, uh, Cold War uh, developers. Okay, I have to stop here since I have to so okay. Now, uh, now I can go. I, I couldn't find it. Before World War I, European nations had a long tradition of forgiving uh, loans made to allies to finance their participation in a common war effort. Uh, but following World War I, the United States uh, did something that uh, was a gray area to Europeans. It insisted that all the other allies pay for the arms sales that they'd uh, bought prior to America's participation in the war. America said, well, of course, once we're allies, we will uh, pay our share and uh, fight the war with you. But uh, you bought arms with us before we went into the, into the war. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons that America went into the war, uh, World War I, on the side of uh, England and France, is it had lent England and France so much money uh, to pay the arms uh, to fight uh, Germany, that if it went on the side of uh, Germany, well, uh, it wouldn't get repaid. It went on the side of its uh, debtors so to make sure that its debtors would have enough money and be willing to repay it uh, when the war was over. So the, uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, asked for payment. The Allies then turned to Germany to provide the money and uh, imposed reparations far beyond the $28 billion that the United States charged them for uh, the arms debts that they'd sold. Uh, the 28 billion may not sound like a lot now, but those were in the, the uh, 1920 dollars, not uh, 2020. They, a dollar went a lot further a century ago. Uh, and Germany's reparations bill was sent at more than twice this amount. It's 60 billion. Uh, dollars in 1921, all payable uh, in uh, the gold equivalent of uh, U.S. dollars. So this totaled altogether 88 billion. And these intergovernmental debts did not have any counterpart in Germany's foreseeable uh, ability to pay. Uh, it couldn't ex uh, export enough money uh, to raise the money to pay the reparations because America raised its tariffs against uh, German and foreign goods. And uh, other countries uh, were devastated by the war. And because they had to use their uh, uh, international reserves to pay the United States, they couldn't afford to buy German exports. So the magnitude of the debts that uh, Europe had, uh, the $88 uh, billion after World War I, far exceeded the value of private international investments. Uh, and they were set without any calculation of Germany's ability to pay or of the United States and other allies' willingness to enable them to pay by buying German and other European exports. So this was uh, not a private sector form of uh, financial imperialism. Instead of serving the interests of Wall Street uh, financiers, uh, it, the harsh US government demands led to a breakdown of world finance. Uh, it led to the stock market crash of 1929, the Great Depression, which destroyed capital, didn't build it up. And yet the primacy of government over private interests was, uh, was assumed to be something natural uh, and even stable. Uh, it was accept well, everybody accepted a century ago that uh, debt payments to the US government should take precedence over payments owed to other, con other concerns for private creditors or bondholders, even to the point of imposing domestic austerity and unemployment and uh, destroying their own economies. Europe was willing to destroy its own economy in the 1920s simply to pay the United States instead of saying, look, the war is over. We're not going to uh, impoverish ourselves and uh, have a another war uh, just uh, in order to pay you. Uh, it, you have the gold, we don't. Okay, we're going to go on to something besides gold. We're going to uh, figure out a, a way to move off gold and uh, off the dollar and uh, just do it among themselves. They could have done that. Nobody even thought about it. From the left wing of, of the political spectrum, the labor parties, the socialist parties, tried just as hard as the right wing parties to say a debt is a debt, we have to pay it. So the, the debt morass showed the tragedy of uh, acceding to creditor demands that debts should be paid even at the cost of imposing deep economic destruction. Uh, the world was able to sacrifice its, its growth and stability by agreeing to satisfy the U.S. creditor demands, 
even when they were so large that debtors could pay only by imposing a depression on themselves and ending up looking like Greece looks today and Argentina looks today. Uh, uh, it seems amazing that they did, that's what they did. Prior to World War I, government intervention in foreign lands usually followed uh, private uh, commerce and investment. So there was, of course, uh, imperialism and colonialism by Europe, but uh, the governments usually backed uh, the private uh, companies and whatever uh, the private businessmen who were pretty prominent in the government wanted, uh, the government would back. But government didn't have a separate interest uh, uh, apart, from, uh, apart from the private sector. Uh, what the private investors wanted in Europe's colonies, they wanted minerals, they wanted tropical plants and other raw materials, uh, and they wanted these countries as captive markets. Uh, the uh, Britain's sterling area, the Frank zone, every uh, imperial country tried to uh, get uh, colonies and uh, pro protectorates that would uh, uh, act as its own markets. So governments uh, used military and naval force to seize territories, to expand the economic interest of their nationals, uh, and to exclude the capitalists of other countries, but it was still private capital backed by military force. Uh, but the intergovernmental uh, super imperialism that uh, emerged uh, uh, in America's hands after World War I was financial in character, not military. America didn't have to conquer colonies. Uh, it, it simply, it conquered the hearts and minds of Europe and other countries. It conquered the minds so that they believed that they had to pay uh, foreign debts, even sacrificing uh, their own national uh, hopes for, for growth. So the emergence of the United States government as the overwhelming world creditor was not a product of private investment. Uh, it wasn't uh, a case of uh, bondholders uh, lending money to foreign governments and then having uh, the uh, uh, US government send in the Marines uh, to collect. It was the US government that was the creditor, not private banks, not private bondholders. Uh, and uh, it was the government that uh, creditor position that determined the foreign policy of the United States, not private capital investment. Uh, nobody had uh, anticipated that uh, uh, before World War I. The only common denominator uh, was the, uh, with Europe was the overriding Western civilization principle that all debts have to be paid regardless of how socially destabilizing the consequences are. And uh, that belief is the center point of almost all the lectures uh, that I'm going to be giving. Uh, and it's the centerpiece that enabled the United States to consolidate uh, its position by having other countries follow America's financial self-interest, even at the cost of their own uh, interests. So for the first time in modern history, international finance uh, became dominated by a single government not a group of governments. And this single government, the US financial claims uh, far overshadowed any kind of private uh, uh, investment. There was very little US private investment in Europe uh, at the time World War I uh, ended. Uh, so no, no writer had anticipated that the main destabilizing and exploitative factor was going to be government, not private capital. Uh, during, uh, in 1917, during the war, Lenin uh, wrote imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. And he anticipated that private capital and its growing concentration would become the major cause of further future conflict. And to many other observers, the hope for peace seemed to, buy, to lie in the resumption of international credit and investment in private hands. Uh, and uh, everybody looked for uh, intergovernmental cooperation to make sure that uh, private investment didn't cause war. Well, in fact, uh, what uh, you had was just the opposite. Uh, you had uh, the private uh, investors, private banks, private bondholders telling the United States, uh, don't insist on paying the debts. Uh, if you, uh, the bankers again and again in the 1920s under the Republican administrations asked the government uh, to uh, reduce the uh, claims on the allies so that uh, Europe could grow and there could be a financial market and a business, business market for American investment and uh, exporters out to Europe. 
uh, the U.S. government said no. Uh, it's the overriding concern of American diplomacy with purely world power, even at the cost of destroying not only other countries, but reducing uh, the ability of its own U.S. banking and financial sector uh, to make money. Uh, it, dis it disrupted uh, the prosperity of the world. So within the emerging post-war finance capitalism, private and government financial policies were at cross purposes. That's why President Hubert Hoover, uh, 1931, announced a moratorium on US international debt demands and German uh, reparations. Stock markets jumped throughout the whole world. Finally, they said, uh, with getting government uh, debt collection and austerity uh, plans out of the way uh, can now revive uh, business, uh, it'll revive export trade, uh, improvements in foreign exchange conditions more than repaid the United States for its loss of the 250 million uh, by uh, some of foreign debt service that uh, uh, that it was getting that it forgave for in 1931. So debt relief suspending intergovernmental claims had a good positive effect on the private international uh, 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 finance capital, not the reverse. And in fact, the conflict quickly broke out at the London Economic Conference in 1933, as uh, incoming President Franklin Roosevelt uh, replaced uh, uh, the Republican uh, Herbert Hoover. Uh, Hoover, along with the Republican Tre Treasury Secretary Ogden Mills, supported the Eastern banking interests. Roosevelt's advisor, Raymond Moley, and his team mistrusted Wall Street bankers, uh, uh, who in the the bankers viewed U.S. government demands as a creditor is antithetical to their own ambitions. They wanted the government creditor claims out of the picture. So led by uh, the uh, J.P. Morgan partner, Russell, uh, Russell Leffingwell, the Wall Street internationalists tried to persuade uh, uh, a State Department Democrat uh, under Roosevelt, Norman Davis, to a position of influence. They wanted their own agents of influence in the Democratic Party. And Moley, uh, Roosevelt's advisor, expressed his mistrust, and he wrote to Davis, quote, wanted to get the debts out of the way to facilitate reviving private lending to Europe, unquote. That's why President Roosevelt rejected Davis's pro-Wall Street advice, and Roosevelt uh, ideas were antithetical uh, to those of the uh, large banking sector. So the U.S. Uh, aim was to subordinate foreign interests to those of its government creditor claims, while escalating America's protective tariffs and quotas. America raised its uh, uh, tariffs, making it uh, even harder for Europe to uh, earn the money to balance uh, uh, its payments and trade with the United States. And this was not really an international uh, world leadership uh, seeking overall world economic recovery. Uh, later uh, pro-American historians say, well, America's world leadership failed. America didn't want world leadership. It was nationalist. Um, America rejected internationalist leadership because it was out for uh, the United States to dominate other countries. And that was uh, the uh, America first policy that was uh, 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 the American firsters accused the Roosevelt administration of rejecting world leadership. Uh, and uh, Roosevelt said, well, what does it mean America first? Is it a, the American government first? or is it the Amer Wall Street creditors in the financial class first? Uh, Roosevelt and his, adv his advisors did not want the kind of international leadership that would have rehabilitated British, French, and other European governments and their economies as equals. Uh, in their mind, freeing Europe from having to pay its war debts to the United States would leave their governments with more money to rearm and threaten World uh, War I. Uh, another world war. And in fact, Roosevelt's advisor said, well, if you uh, forgive them uh, their debts, they're just going to use their money to buy more arms and go to war. Well, of course, war did occur. And it ended up with the US government in an even stronger position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe and Japan. Uh, so uh, at this time, it moved to absorb the sterling and franc areas into its own dollar-centered financial system. Uh, uh, and again, it used intergovernment debts as the, uh, as the lever in order to uh, make Europe dependent on it. And uh, this was established both in loans to Britain and by the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund, 
and the World Bank that were incorporated uh, in 1944 in the United States. Now, for, ever, for the, uh, the last 75 years, people have said, oh, the World Bank and the IMF are internationalists. Uh, it's altruistic. America put up the money to help uh, uh, create an international harmony. But uh, in fact, uh, the IMF and the World Bank from the very beginning were imperialist ventures by the United States to uh, make other countries dependent on it and to concentrate financial and export uh, uh, power in the US economy, not in uh, uh, Europe, not in the Sterling area uh, or the Frank area. So, so when uh, uh, the US diplomats uh, set to work on global planning, they use the government's creditor power as a lever to open foreign markets uh, to US exports and to US investors. And they saw this as a tactic to consolidate U.S. control over uh, over foreign uh, foreign economies. So instead of seeking direct payment of its wartime loans, as uh, happened after World War One, uh, the uh, U.S. officials set about trying to conquer its allies in a more enlightened manner this time, demanding economic concessions in a, as a part of a commercial bargain. So it said, "Well, we're not going to ask you to pay. We're going to give." you money this time. We'll lend you money instead of uh, acting as a creditor but as, as a, uh, and demanding you pay. But uh, while in exchange for us giving you loans to get by and rebuild your economy, uh, you're going to have to make certain concessions. You're going to have to give up the sterling area. You're going to have to stop your own protectionism and uh, agree to uh, uh, buy in US markets, not your own markets. And this was uh, nationalism uh, writ large. No other country or grouping of countries uh, uh, should ever be in a position to dictate economic and diplomatic policy uh, to the United States, the Americans said. Uh, uh, it, it, what was at issue was who is going to dictate policy to whom? Uh, US officials said, we will not be a member of any organization where other uh, countries can tell us what to do. Uh, so uh, we're going to join the IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, but we need to have veto power uh, by having uh, uh, a quota set uh, that we're the only country with veto power. We need to veto the World Bank. If we join the United Nations, we're going to have to have veto power. And that's how the Security Council came into being. And the United States refused to join the World Court because it said, we don't have to obey the laws of any other nation. The United States can set the law. And uh, you've seen the neoliberals in the last few years say, America creates its own reality uh, and it creates its own law. That's what makes the United States the exceptional country. So the first post-war aim of the United States was for uh, the dollar to replace sterling as the world's uh, major currency uh, and as, as the basis of the monetary system in general. Uh, Germany had been unable to conquer England in World War uh, I and II, but the United States was able to do it without uh, firing a shot uh, because it, uh, it, it had the money and uh, England simply uh, felt willing to surrender to the United States and give the United States everything it asked for. So America's creditor position remained the key uh, leverage. Uh, the Treasury Secretary under Roosevelt, Henry Morgenthau, uh, started putting on pressure on Britain to sell off uh, their uh, big uh, big companies, Shell Oil, Le Lever uh, uh, Brothers, uh, Brown and Williamson Tobacco. And in January 1941, the Senate Relations Committee promised, and I'll quote, if Lord and Lady Astor, the uh, British royal family members, own real estate in New York, their assets will be on the auction block uh, within the rest. America said uh, you, European countries should sell all the assets they had in America, and they should let America buy European assets. This was the beginning of the double standards that's lasted for the last 75 years. Well, the first fight was over America's lend-lease loans to Britain. Uh, uh, America had made uh, arranged a system where uh, they would finance uh, uh, the costs of Britain's war effort by lending or leasing it the money. They would lend it the money with the understanding that uh, at the end of the war, uh, England would repay uh, the United States for the, uh, what, uh, the cost of building its military bases and uh, 
uh, its other uh, articles. So there was a, a historian, uh, uh, Richard Gardner, wrote a book, Sterling Dollar Diplomacy, uh, which is sort of the uh, his, uh, official history. And he wrote, I'll quote what he wrote in it, the price of congressional cooperation in appropriating Lend-Lease funds was the assurance that the president would require some benefit in return for Lend-Lease beyond the defense of the United States by the military action of other countries. In other words, the uh, Congress had to approve any kind of financial agreement that the United States made with England or Europe or other countries. And Congress said, uh, you have to get a quid pro quo. Congress has always been the right wing a militarist uh, uh, arm, largely uh, Southern congressmen, uh, saying you have, we have to win. Uh, and the attitude of Congress is, is that, uh, that Donald Trump uh, has announced again and again. If we, uh, any contract we make with other countries, America has to win, they have to lose. That was his uh, campaign slogan when he was running for president uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, and that's the uh, but uh, uh, exactly what congressmen, the American First Committee, and others uh, insisted. So uh, the representative for Britain uh, negotiating uh, these debts were, was John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and in 1941, he was given a draft of the Lend-Lease Agreement uh, that called for a very strict commitment to non-discriminatory foreign trade uh, and the end of British preference. British imperial preference meant Britain had given special tariff preference to its colonies and uh, allied uh, protectorates like Canada uh, and uh, Australia. Uh, America said, you have to end this tariff preference. Uh, you have to have the same tariffs for uh, everybody else. No more preferential tariff for members of the British Commonwealth. Now, uh, ending that uh, 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 left uh, the Commonwealth countries with a lot of money that they built up during uh, during uh, the war. During World War II, England's colonies had provided it with uh, uh, raw materials, uh, with uh, exports, with all sorts of, effort, of uh, material for the war effort that England uh, had paid for uh, in sterling. And these uh, were called blocked sterling balances. The agreement that England had signed with India, uh, African uh, colonies, uh, uh, Australia, where that uh, its Commonwealth countries could only spend these dollars within the Commonwealth, mainly on Britain for British exports and for British goods. Uh, but America said, you, you have to uh, abolish this uh, protectionist policy and let these uh, uh, billions of dollars of uh, sterling balances be uh, available to be paid anywhere. Uh, and of course, the United States was in the position to uh, be the major market and the major uh, export supplier to these countries. So in effect, America said, uh, we, uh, you, you, we want to replace Britain in your own colonial markets. We want uh, uh, India and South Africa, uh, Australia and others to buy American exports, not your own British exports. And uh, Britain agreed. Uh, so that uh, part of the Lend-Lease Agreement uh, Article uh, 7 said, called for the elimination of all forms of discriminatory treatment in international commerce, uh, and also to reduce tariff and other trade barriers. So Keynes uh, said, uh, noted uh, that nothing at all in this agreement uh, uh, says anything about America lowering its tariffs or uh, lowering its protection. America said, well, you have to uh, abolish all of your uh, 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 pre preferences. We're going to uh, raise our agricultural qu quotas and tariffs, and we can protect ourselves, but no other country in the world can protect itself. That's the international law that we want Britain to sign. And Britain is willing to sign it, and by signing it, it set the stage for all the other European countries to sort of follow. And once the European countries followed, the third world countries were faced with a fait accompli. What could they do? They went along, they could say, well, I guess that's the world system. I guess we better sign on or be left out. Uh, and at that time, countries were not uh, rich enough themselves. They, they didn't have the ability to be self-sufficient, uh, to have any option except to depend uh, on the United States uh, because they had 
uh, not done what the United States had done or Germany had done and protected their own uh, self-sufficiency. So uh, the uh, uh, America's uh, uh, new president after Roosevelt, Harry Truman, uh, said that uh, when it came time for repayment of uh, the Lend-Lease, then if Britain can't pay its dollars for petroleum needed by her that uh, uh, America was supplying her. Uh, Truman uh, in World War II was head of the uh, Senate War Investigating Committee. And so Truman was setting uh, the rules of, uh, uh, on which the Senate would lend money uh, to Britain to enable it to do the war. And Truman uh, wrote that if Britain needs uh, oil, uh, because, or it's, uh, it needs ships or it's shortage of anything, uh, then uh, it has to pledge to America uh, the petroleum resources that it has in Asia, South America, the Dutch East, East Indies uh, shell, uh, uh, should turn over its foreign assets to the United States to pay for this oil after the war. Well, you can imagine right after the war, uh, America uh, proceeded to say, okay, uh, now you owe us the money, give us the, uh, your foreign oil assets, your foreign raw materials assets, all, all the assets in, in the colonies uh, that you've had. So the uh, American government insisted that uh, the wartime lend-lease support stop with the end of hostilities. And uh, all of a sudden, peace, here there was peace in 1945. America stopped lending England money. England was broke. And so it, it needed, what was it going to do in the first year of peace? It, it needed to import. It needed to rebuild the economy. And so uh, it needed a new loan. And uh, 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 the $10 billion in sterling balances that I mentioned, uh, uh, America already had said, well, we want it to be spent on us, not on you. Uh, Egypt, Argentina, India, and other countries were holding these. So uh, America said, well, I guess you need a new loan. So it negotiated uh, the British loan, and the British loan locked in all of the American power uh, over, over Britain. And the reason I'm spending so much time on the U.S. Uh, negotiations with Britain is these negotiations were the dress rehearsal and uh, the prototype for the kind of arrangements that America then presented uh, Europe and third world countries with. So England was uh, the weak link in the chain. Uh, uh, the weak link, a very pro-American and uh, very, very right wing uh, that it said, well, if we give uh, we give everything to America. We know that America will support the upper class. It'll support the, the property owning class. So we'll give up our power to America because America will prevent any left wing movement anywhere in the world. And uh, we're Britain. So of course, uh, we oppose the left. So this was also part of uh, a global right wing uh, policy of surrendering to America, figuring out that America would uh, impose on the rest of the world pro-creditor rules and uh, pro-property rules and prevent democracy from developing anywhere. And everybody was terrified that there would be democracy that would actually lead other countries to become self-sufficient and independent. And uh, uh, America and England and then Europe agreed there could not be any democracy in the third world. There had to be dependency. You had to prevent the third world and other countries, uh, including China, uh, from uh, developing their own industry and their own uh, independence. The whole idea was to turn them into colonies or provinces, uh, since there was no longer official colonies. They were economic provinces uh, and basically financial uh, provinces. Uh, so it, uh, the result was that Europe and America were obliged to relinquish concepts of their own economic self-sufficiency and reject a return to such policies by joining the appropriate international organizations, the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, and that's why the United States took the lead in creating uh, the International Monetary Fund to ensure a post-war system of fixed ex currency parities uh, and the World Bank uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, the third world into export uh, economies, exporting raw materials and labor intensive uh, handicrafts, uh, but not high technology uh, labor, and especially not to feed, uh, feed themselves by growing their own grain. So uh, the IMF was uh, funded by subscriptions that were paid in by member countries. 
uh, and the voting rights were proportional to the amount of money that was paid in. And since the United States had the most money to pay it in, uh, it got the uh, largest vote, and that is what gave it the veto power uh, that I uh, mentioned above. Any nation willing to join the bank, uh, uh, the World Bank, to get uh, reconstruction loans had to agree to join the fund uh, and promise to service all outstanding and future official government uh, and government guaranteed debts to all foreign creditors. So you had a creditor oriented uh, system uh, imposed at the very beginning. Now, hardly by surprise, the uh, economic theory and institutional proposals of every country reflect its immediate and short term self interest. US negotiators set the stage for a three uh, and uh, three quarters billion British loan in 1946, as I mentioned, by terminating lend lease, leaving England without any uh, credit. Uh, and that threatened uh, the economy with uh, insolvency if, if Britain didn't sign on. And the terms of the British loan prevented Britain from devaluing the pound sterling until 1949. That meant that uh, if England ran a balance of payments and trade deficit as it did, it couldn't devalue sterling to uh, make its exports more competitive. It had to overvalue sterling. Uh, and that of course kept uh, the value of sterling balances by uh, India, Egypt, Argentina, and other countries high enough so that they could buy more American uh, exports. So uh, sterling was overvalued, uh, it hurt Britain, it, uh, it helped uh, Egypt, Argentina, and other countries, India, uh, to buy American exports, uh, and essentially made uh, sterling a satellite uh, currency of the dollar, uh, the reverse of what had occurred in uh, the 19th century. Uh, so at this point, uh, with the dollar uh, being the central world currency, and the dollar being convertible into gold at $35 an ounce, that made the dollar as good as gold because it was convertible. Uh, uh, you could go and buy it uh, on the official market, the Lon London Gold Rule. Uh, so it was called the Gold and Dollar Exchange Standard. Uh, and uh, uh, the result was that uh, the United States gained $5 billion more in gold from 1945 to 1950 as um, uh, capital continued to flow to the United States. Other countries saw that their economies were not growing. The United States was recovering. Uh, it was a, a golden age for the United States, the uh, uh, late 40s and early 50s. So the United States continued to build up uh, its own gold power. So let's look, look back for a second. Let me take one break. I have to move, I have to move this closer. Let me see. Yeah, I, I have to do that. I couldn't read. Okay. Now, still, uh, Britain's Treasury representative, Keynes, uh, went to the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference with a plan for an, uh, an international current clearing union that would have settled out international payments by putting pressure for adjustment on creditor countries. So th there was an alternative plan. The world didn't have to end up the way it was shaped after World War II. There was another way of doing things, and Keynes designed an, another plan. His plan was for the International Monetary Fund to issue a new fiat international currency to finance deficits. And the currency would be called the Bancor. Not the dollar, not the sterling, but the Bancor, meaning it was a fiat currency. Just like the United States today prints dollars electronically and just prints them uh, like greenbacks, uh, the IMF, uh, uh, the clearing union, uh, would provide credit to enable countries uh, to expand. And the, all these countries would have uh, an overdraft right on uh, the uh, IMF, and it would use its bankor as a currency as good as the US dollar, as good as gold that was uh, backed by the dollar, backed by gold, which meant the same thing as backing by the dollar. But uh, the IMF would have simply created the currency and uh, let other countries draw on it to finance their imports and to finance their post-war uh, recovery. And uh, Keynes version did not require governments to pay their subscription in their own currency. In other words, uh, Britain wouldn't have to turn in sterling, 
France wouldn't have to pay in francs, uh, China wouldn't have to pay in yen, uh, and the U.S. wouldn't have to pay in dollars. It was a pure uh, bank or uh, it was an overdraft facility uh, in the clearing union, uh, handled just as accounting uh, credits and debits on the books. And at the point where the balance of payments of accreditor countries became unmanageably high, so high that they couldn't be paid, these credits uh, uh, that uh, the U.S. would have for the IMF uh, drawing uh, uh, down its currency would be would be canceled. In other words, if creditors, uh, if the U.S. became so strong as a creditor position that other countries couldn't pay, the U.S. creditor position would be wiped out. Uh, otherwise, you'd have the kind of instability that you had in the 1920s with the uh, European inter-ally debts and the German reparations. Uh, and in fact, Keynes sought uh, to uh, insert a scarce currency clause that would have prevented creditor nations from monopolizing the world's money. Uh, but the financial monopoly was just what the United States officials wanted. Uh, their, the, and U.S. policy was determined to ensure that no alternative would emerge to the U.S. dollar. No uh, special drawing rights by the International Monetary Fund. No other currency as a world currency, only uh, the dollar or gold, as Americans say, my way or the highway. Uh, America uh, enabled uh, its gold holdings to be maintained as the basis of all the international financial system instead of the managed paper credit standard uh, that Keynes had, support, uh, had uh, proposed. And ha uh, having obtained British support, uh, America just turned down Keynes's proposal, and uh, uh, then it turned to continental Europe, and uh, Europe agreed. And uh, so when uh, the war ended in 1945 uh, with the US IMF and World Bank plans in, uh, in force, uh, the US gold holdings stood at $20 billion. And this was about 60% of the whole world's international gold reserves. They rose by another over 4 billion in 1948. And by 1945, uh, the US gold stock reached its all time high of almost $25 billion. And that reflected the inflow of nearly the $5 billion since the end of the war. So uh, th what that meant is that America's reconstruction plans and the IMF and the World Bank didn't help Europe recover. It uh, drained even more from Europe. It didn't help third world countries and colonies recover. It drained even more from them. France lost 60% of its gold exchange reserves between 1946 and 1947. And uh, Sweden fell by 75%, while the United States continued to accumulate gold. So this inflow showed that neither the World Bank's reconstruction loans uh, uh, nor the World Bank IMF stabilization loans helped either reconstruction or stabilization. Uh, the effect was merely to destabilize uh, the economy by making it more and more unipolar on the United States. And the reason I've spent so much time explaining uh, the role of gold in the creditor system and how exploitative it was is that this is the same discussion that is underlying the kind of uh, monetary restructuring uh, that we're talking about uh, in, in today's world. Uh, so uh, the, the road to this new need to de began in 1950 when uh, the United States balance of payments moved steadily into deficit uh, as a result of uh, military spending uh, in, the, in uh, Korea and elsewhere in Asia. Uh, for the next uh, 20 uh, years, quarter century, the entire U.S. deficit was military in character. As I've mentioned before, the private sector, private trade and investment were exactly in balance. It was, uh, uh, when you talked about the balance of payments deficit that is putting gold in the foreign central bank reserves, these are entirely dollars spent by the US military. So uh, when you say that we're on a dollar standard uh, or a treasury bill standard, it's on an American military standard. It's a military spending. Uh, and the objective is for America to make foreign countries to uh, bear all of the costs of its foreign military spending across the world. That is the essence of the current international financial system. And that is exactly what's leading other countries that don't agree with these uh, American policies to want to withdraw. Well, matters 
came to a head in the Vietnam War uh, when uh, matters became really serious by 1964 and 1975. I think as I've mentioned before, every Friday the Federal Reserve Board published statistics on the US gold holdings, the degree to which US paper currency was backed uh, by the gold stock. And the legal backing was 25%. And uh, the US gold holdings uh, uh, that had been 25 billion were slowly declining, slowly declining towards the point where they no longer uh, backed uh, the paper currency, the dollar uh, greenbacks uh, in your pocket that uh, are, are gold. And everyone was saying, well, something has got to give, something's got to end. Well, General uh, de Gaulle, uh, of France was the most vocal in cashing in surplus dollars uh, flowing in uh, uh, from its banks in Vietnam, Laos, and other foreign colonies. Uh, and uh, there were few US banks. Uh, Chase Manhattan was asked to help uh, solve this problem by setting up a branch in Saigon. And it was built like a fortress. Uh, and not, it was not a business decision, uh, but uh, David Rockefeller wanted to be a patriotic citizen uh, so that he had uh, taken over the bank from George Champion and uh, agreed to uh, help the US war effort. Now, I was at Chase at that time as a balance of payments economist, and George Champion had been one of the most outspoken critics of the Vietnam War and its military spending. He said it was not fiscally responsible. So here again, you have Wall Street and finance capital disagreeing with America's Cold War strategy. So uh, the Cold War became a military subjugation uh, system that ended up breaking the finance capital stability system uh, for purely military Cold War means. Quite frankly, Congress and the president and American voters and the American working class uh, want to dominate other worlds mono, uh, militarily. And uh, they don't, they want to put America first and uh, uh, they are not internationalists. They are very strongly nationalist and that's why Donald Trump uh, is president. So political support for American uh, military policy did not come from Wall Street. Uh, it came from the labor movement and from uh, national security uh, advocates, uh, Southerners uh, who still want to fight the civil war. Now, in Europe, increasingly large political demonstrations were mounted uh, against the war uh, as anti-Americanism mounted in response to all the atrocities that are, uh, were reported, the My Lai massacre, the napalming of uh, forests, uh, the dropping of Agent Orange, uh, poisoning uh, Vietnam. There, were, there was a huge movement against the war. It was led by the, up, by the middle class, by the financial class, by Wall Street, against, with, uh, against uh, the labor movement and against uh, the right wing uh, working class. That's why President Johnson said, I can't get rid of the war in Vietnam. The, the workers will never vote for Democratic if we don't uh, uh, continue the war. I'm doing it for the working class. I'm doing it for the voters. I'm doing it for the Democratic Party uh, and its uh, roots in the, in the working class. Uh, it's necessary that foreign countries realize uh, that uh, this is really uh, the, uh, the internal domestic politics of the United States that underlie its uh, aggressive uh, foreign diplomacy. Uh, none of the war was good for civilian industry uh, or for banking. And uh, matters uh, reached the head crisis proportion in January 1965, when President Lyndon Johnson announced voluntary balance of payments controls. Uh, and U.S. banks and U.S. companies were told that they could not increase their foreign investment or foreign loan volume more than 5% more than the investments that they had at the end of 1964. So uh, all of a sudden, business plans were disrupted. Oil industry, uh, if oil, the oil industry followed it, they would have to not uh, invest more in Near Eastern oil and other countries' oil. Uh, manufacturers could not build, build up their foreign affiliates. And uh, this, would, uh, this would hurt uh, the balance of payments. Uh, and the business sector pointed out that what was called foreign investment didn't really constitute a dollar outflow. When, an, uh, when uh, oil companies invest abroad, uh, what do they do? They send uh, U.S. equipment from the United States to Saudi Arabia or uh, elsewhere in the Near East. They send management. 
Uh, they lend money to the affiliates and charge interest. Uh, they they uh, uh, take profits. None of these dollars uh, that are spent on the foreign oil investment left the United States. It's as if uh, US oil investment in Saudi Arabia and the Near East were really part of the US economy, not part of the Saudi Arabian economy. And in fact, oil uh, industry, uh, the oil wells are, were uh, written on the books as branches of the parent company. And the, their, their uh, operations were consolidated into the parent company balance sheet. They were not part of the foreign economy at all. So the oil industry uh, asked uh, Chase Manhattan uh, to write a report uh, showing that uh, the oil industry did not really create a dollar outflow at all, and that Roosevelt was, uh, that uh, President Johnson was just being uh, ignorantly militaristic and destructive of, the, of American uh, uh, imperialism by uh, limiting uh, the balance of payments. Uh, there was a, a discussion with the government. The government said, we don't, essentially, the uh, uh, President Johnson's position is, we're willing to uh, uh, shrink American industry. We're willing to uh, uh, prevent American banking from expanding just so that we can fight the war in Vietnam because that's what the union leaders want. Uh, and that's what uh, the American people want. Well, of course, it's not what the American people wanted because there were uh, Roosevelt, uh, I keep saying that, it was not what the American people wanted because President Johnson uh, would, was faced with huge protests and demonstrations everywhere that he would go. He would have to leave hotels through uh, the, the toilets in the rear and sneak out of the hotels so that he wouldn't hear the mob yelling, uh, hey, hey, LG Bay, LLBJ, how many babies did you kill today? Uh, and there was a sigh of relief when uh, Johnson realized that he'd become the most hated president in American history for being such a murderer and uh, uh, decided to announce that he would step down. I was watching television at the time and you could hear the cheers going up all through the neighborhood. Everyone was watching his press conference and he announced he would not run. Finally, they cheered, hoping that the war could be over. Well, of course, it wasn't over because you had Henry Kissinger and uh, uh, the ultra-right uh, Russia haters uh, that came in and prolonged it for uh, more than four years. But there was a belief that at least finally there would be an ending of the war. And the business community said, finally, business can recover uh, because uh, the war is over. Well, what happened, in fact, was that Secretary of State Henry Kissinger uh, uh, hated Russia, hated communism, hated labor, uh, loved uh, rich people, and he extended the war to Laos, Cambodia. He said, um, his phrase was, bomb the enemy to the peace ta table. He said, if America can bomb enough countries, every country will be afraid to do anything that we don't tell them to do, because we'll treat, uh, we'll use Laos and Cambodia as an example of how we can crush any country. We will drop napalm on you, we'll drop Agent Orange, we will poison your country if you do, if you do not obey the United States. So that, uh, and he got, uh, a point, uh, President Nixon, when he was uh, elected, uh, took uh, Kissinger on board from uh, the governor, uh, Nelson Rockefeller of New York, where Kissinger uh, had been an advisor from. So it's at this point that uh, US diplomats uh, began to say, well, we've, we're just about run out of gold. We're running out of gold quickly. Uh, they revived Keynes's idea for an international clearing union uh, in the form of what they called special drawing rights to be issued by the International Monetary Fund. And the idea finally was to give other countries overdraft uh, facilities in proportion to their IMF quotas uh, with the US having uh, the largest quota, uh, as I mentioned. The difference is that Keynes's plan aimed at financing economic recovery and expansion of European economies to create means of production, not military spending to destroy it uh, in countries deemed uh, to be US adversaries. And uh, the United States uh, basically announced all other countries are our adversaries. Uh, our number one adversaries are our allies. Uh, our first adversary was England. Our second adversary was France and Europe. 
uh, our third adversary were the uh, third world uh, countries. Uh, so uh, you, you don't want to be a close ally or a supporter of the United States because you will be, uh, the, the more close you are to the United States as a supporter, the more it looks at you as the, an adversary. As uh, you could see in Japan um, in the 1975 and 6 uh, Plaza Accords and uh, uh, the other accord that wrecked uh, uh, the Japanese economy uh, by 1980. Well, finally, uh, in August 1971, it became apparent that the price for continuing U.S. military attacks was uh, either to lose uh, uh, the shrinking gold stock uh, or you cut, uh, cut the dollar loose from gold. Uh, so the U.S. in 1971 ended convertibility of the dollar into gold. It stopped supplying treasury gold of the London gold pool, which it, it, it had been uh, selling to hold down the gold price. And the gold price, of course, soared. And that ended the U.S. ability to exert world power through its uh, uh, near monopoly of monetary gold and credit to Europe. Now, many politicians uh, worried that this would uh, mean the end of America's diplomatic leverage over the world's financial system. Uh, ever since World War I, the United States had dominated world diplomacy by its credited position. It monopolized most of the gold uh, and therefore uh, the monetary base. And there was great worry in 1971 about what would happen when the U.S. economy uh, uh, no longer uh, could do this. Other countries suffering gold outflows traditionally had to impose austerity. Hard money uh, business economists in the U.S. Forecast that if, well, now that we're off gold, we're running a balance of payments deficit, the currency is going to go down, we're going to drive the dollar down, and uh, that'll cause inflation. Uh, and uh, indeed, Treasury Secretary uh, John Connolly uh, uh, depreciated the dollar's exchange rate by 5% at the same time that it stopped uh, gold sales. And he said to Europeans, it's our dollar, it's your problem. So the dilemma that uh, uh, was posed for uh, European and foreign banks. Uh, what, what happened after uh, 1971, uh, delinking the dollar from gold turned out to be something quite different uh, than was anticipated. Ending the gold exchange standard opened the way for a new form of dollar hegemony, uh, one based on America's leverage as the world's greatest monetary debtor, not creditor. Uh, the great question was how Europe and other leading economies were going to cope, uh, cope with this glut of new dollars now that they no longer were able to get gold for their dollars. Uh, central banks had little option regarding what to do with these dollars uh, that were being pumped out by continued U.S. military spending and also investment buyouts to foreign assets. Sovereign wealth funds didn't yet exist. Central banks don't buy stocks or bonds and they were not going to buy U.S. companies or real estate. So what central banks usually buy uh, is limited to the securities and bonds of other governments. And the only major supply of such government securities were U.S. Treasury bonds, Treasury IOUs. So that's what central banks bought. Instead of the gold standard, they, the world moved on to a Treasury bill standard. And here's the problem that this caused for foreign economies. If their central banks did not recycle their dollar inflows to the United States by buying treasury securities, then their exchange rates would rise. If, uh, uh, if uh, dollars began to flow into their economy, uh, you have to buy their francs and uh, uh, now euros. Uh, and that pushes up uh, the value of uh, the local currency, just as buying Chinese uh, exports pushes up uh, the value of China's currency. If China doesn't take these dollars and then uh, re, uh, buy other dollar assets. It's not going to buy dollar uh, uh, exports more than uh, what it needs for agriculture to feed itself, but it'll buy uh, U.S. government uh, bonds, which is why China became such a big uh, U.S. bond holder, financing the U.S. military uh, deficit in the process. If it didn't do this, that would rise the price of uh, its currency and increase the price of its exports relative to dollar area economies, and this would reduce uh, their volume accordingly. So to pre prevent the dollar glut from giving dollar area exports a price advantage, nations receiving a surplus of these dollars use them to buy treasury securities to support the dollar's exchange rate and prevent their own exchange rate from rising. 
And uh, the effect was uh, not only to support the dollar, but to finance the U.S. domestic budget deficit, the U.S. Tre Treasury bonds, uh, which uh, resulted largely from the $1 trillion a year uh, military uh, spending. So this was a new kind of international circular flow. Uh, and in order to understand uh, world diplomacy, follow the money. You have to make a chart and see what is pushing dollars into the economy, where do the dollars end up, how are they recycled to the US economy? What happens to Chinese, Russian, or European currency that's spent abroad? Where do these dollars end up? Uh, follow the circular flow. Uh, is it on trade account? Is it on capital account for financial loans and uh, investments? Uh, uh, that's not done in any of the textbooks, but it's the uh, obvious way that uh, anyone uh, uh, can see what's happening. Uh, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a new kind of uh, circular flow in which the more U.S. securities foreign, govern foreign governments bought, the more they, they were hooked, the more they, they'd lose. It, as Ch China found that the more uh, U.S. Uh, tra uh, treasury securities are bought, what if the U.S. would devalue? What if uh, the, uh, China would make a move that would hurt the U.S. economy? The U.S. dollar would go down, and the value of these uh, dollar U.S. Uh, treasury bonds, as measured in Chinese uh, currency, would go down. So uh, China would lose in the RMB value of the dollars, just as Europe would lose in the euro value of a depreciating dollar. So Americans became quite, uh, quite explicit in playing this game, and they demanded that foreign countries recycle their uh, uh, inflows into the U.S. markets, uh, but not to buy majority of U.S. companies. Only the United States as the world's exceptional nation can buy the commanding heights of other countries. And uh, this became, uh, became quite explicit in 1973 when uh, uh, the United States had quadrupled the price of its grain uh, in order to increase uh, its balance of payments. And so OPEC oil producers responded by quadrupling the price of uh, their oil uh, so as not to lose purchasing power. And uh, State Department officials told their counterparts in Saudi Arabia and other Arab oil producing countries uh, that they'd agree not to oppose this price increase. You can raise your prices as long as uh, these countries agreed to recycle their dollars into U.S. financial markets. And in fact, they were told that failure to spend the uh, oil dollars, petrodollars, in uh, the U.S. Uh, United States would be treated as an act of war. So uh, partly, uh, I think Saudi Arabian's king announced he was buying a million shares of every uh, company listed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, they bought treasury securities, they bought corporate bonds, and they also put a lot of money in uh, foreign banks. So the, the, uh, this flood of US military spending abroad and uh, ended up being in the hands of oil producing countries that were getting money not only from the United States, but dollar payments from uh, Latin America, dollar payments from Europe for oil. And uh, th uh, this money uh, was uh, ba basically uh, recycled uh, to the United States. And the banks that re received these uh, dollars that were being recycled lent them to third world countries to pay for their increasingly expensive grain and other imports. So you had an explosion of US bank lending to uh, uh, third world countries between 1973 and 1982, when uh, finally the Latin American debt bomb exploded when uh, uh, Mexico announced that it uh, didn't have any money to pay the debt. The bank lending in the 1970s to third world countries was just as reckless as uh, the junk mortgage lending in, uh, in the United States in the, uh, the early 2000s. Uh, the lending was made without any uh, calculation of whether the countries that were borrowing these dollars would be able to pay, uh, uh, pay it all. Now, the United States also played both sides of the creditor and debtor diplomacy. Uh, on the one hand, they took a pro-creditor position when dealing with third world countries and other countries running, running deficits. Uh, the Washington consensus, uh, uh, really the Washington policy since 1980, called for the IMF and for bondholders to back very harsh creditor conditions uh, 
in order to re roll over the loans that they've made and not foreclose on the loans of Argentina, Brazil, other third world countries. And uh, the conditions, uh, which are called conditionalities, uh, imposed uh, austerity conditions. Uh, countries had to privatize uh, and sell off uh, their uh, natural resources and uh, their public enterprises. And they had to keep devaluing their currencies. And by devaluing their currencies, what they were devaluing was the price of their labor. Uh, because uh, basically a foreign currency uh, is determined by labor costs because raw materials have a common world price, machinery and other inputs have a common world price. The variable in uh, international price comparisons is almost always labor. So uh, a, a country trying to so-called stabilize its balance of trade and payments means impoverishing uh, its labor force. This is one of the problems with uh, a creditor-oriented international monetary system. So the effect was destructive and predatory as European colonialism had been. Uh, European imperialism was hypocritical in claiming to develop the colonial uh, periphery. And in reality, it turns its colonies and dependence into mo trade and monetary satellites. Well, America's uh, internationalist uh, Washington consensus under the IMF, World Bank, and International Bondholders Councils is uh, just as predatory as uh, European colonialism uh, had done. It made uh, third world countries into uh, economic uh, satellites and uh, import dependencies. Uh, and it's turned them into grandier economies uh, uh, while financializing uh, Western economies in a way in which local uh, client oligarchies are uh, supported and American rules through client oligarchies that uh, uh, are assigned uh, uh, management of the uh, uh, public enterprises and raw materials being privatized. So all of this is being welcomed as a post-industrial uh, society. Uh, but it's precisely what uh, classical economists from uh, Adam Smith to Marshall, uh, Thorstein Veblen, John Stuart Mill, all tried to avoid. Uh, in, in the 19th century, classical economics all looked at the dynamic of industrial capitalism as being the free economies from rent seeking. The whole idea was that wealthy industrial nations were going to invest in less developed countries to help them catch up and spread democratic politics and public investment to modernize colonial and other developed economies. Uh, Karl Marx believed that Tell also. He gave a speech to the Chartists. Uh, uh, the labor uh, organizations of London saying that, well, British investment in India is going to end up uh, breaking down India's backwardness and it will make, uh, uh, help make England uh, replicate industrial capitalism in these countries. Uh, almost everybody in the 19th century had that optimistic view and they saw finally colonialism will be something positive. It'll help industrialize countries. Uh, but as we all know, that's not what happened. Uh, instead, uh, uh, colonialism and uh, the American Washington consensus, today's neoliberal post-classical economics rejects the classical economic doctrine of freeing markets from rent seekers and uh, freeing governments from control by their uh, narrow art oligarchies. Now, this is not progress. It is a post-industrial society, but it's really a relapse. Uh, in the backwardness. It's almost a retrogression uh, back to feudal uh, property owning uh, creditor class. And uh, here's the problem that third world debtors face today and that other countries wanting to withdraw from the dollar standards uh, uh, also face. Uh, how are they going to finance uh, trade uh, among themselves? US officials still relate to the third world debtor countries with a pro-creditor position. Uh, demand, defending bondholders, uh, both U.S. investors and also many bondholders of Argentina, Brazil, and third world countries are rich Argentinians and rich Brazilians. And they know because they control the government that they are going to pay the foreign debts, mainly to themselves operating out of their offshore bank accounts. Uh, and now vulture funds have taken over. And vulture funds, uh, once the third world or the regular financial uh, 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 major institutions and banks say, well, okay, we realize that uh, there's a coronavirus right now. We realize that raw materials uh, prices are declining and that the third world 
uh, countries can't pay their debts. Let's uh, let's sell off our bonds. You know, we, we we're taking our money and running. And they sell out to vulture funds who buy these bonds at just a few pennies on the dollar. Like, and that's what's uh, happened to uh, uh, a lot of uh, Argentina bonds. Uh, there's a whole fight right now over uh, whether Argentina can write down its foreign debts uh, and they're being sued by vulture funds that say, no, you have to pay 100 cents on the dollar. We spent two cents on the dollar to buy your bonds and we want to be repaid 100 cents on the dollar. That's how we make the money. And that is what they're amazingly enough. That, that is what the international legal uh, courts are having to handle. And obviously, if you buy uh, Argentinian or Brazilian bonds at two cents or 10 cents on the dollar, it, why should you have any right to get 100 cents on the dollar? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the basis of finance uh, capitalism, uh, enlightened finance capitalism, is okay. Uh, we have a, a claim on a country. We, we can't get more than they can pay. So let's write down the debt to reflect what they can pay. Just like uh, when a stock uh, company, when a company will lose its uh, uh, sales markets or its export markets, the stock price uh, declines. The debt uh, price should decline to reflect the actual ability to pay. That is not uh, the basis of international law today. International law says uh, any claim should be paid at face value, otherwise send in the Marines or put sanctions on the country and uh, uh, foreclose on it by letting the bondholders grab whatever assets the country has abroad. I mentioned earlier Venezuela's uh, oil uh, distribution networks in the US and uh, uh, Argentina's uh, naval ships in Africa, uh, which actually the courts would not let uh, Paul Singer's uh, uh, vulture fund grab. So the coronavirus has uh, slashed industrial production throughout the world. It's, uh, it's uh, thrown third world uh, trade uh, into uh, a deficit. And uh, uh, the question is, how are you go uh, going to uh, have a world system that doesn't impoverish countries by having a one-sided creditor rule? So while the US follows a debtor policy towards Europe and China and Russia and payment surplus countries, saying you have to accept our IOUs even though we can't pay them. It says uh, uh, for the third world and other weak uh, non-industrial countries, you can't accept their IOUs at all. You have to foreclose and grab what they have, but you can't foreclose on us. You can't use your dollars to do what you do to Latin America. You can't use your dollars to take America's uh, 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 investments in your countries. You can't use the dollars to buy American assets uh, abroad and seize them as American bondholders can seize other countries. This is the double financial standard that is the basis for Amer America's dollar hegemony today. Now, third world countries cannot uh, do what uh, people were in America could do. They can't inflate their way out of debt by printing more money because their debt is denominated in foreign currencies not in their own current currencies. They, they can print uh, pesos, but they can't print dollars and their foreign debt is in dollars. So uh, 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 they can't get out of uh, the debt quandary in the way that the United States can inflate its way out of dollar debt. Now, for the same reason, they can't increase taxes to uh, uh, raise the money to pay uh, foreign creditors. The IMF keeps telling uh, other countries, raise taxes on labor, not on business. It, it, uh, the first thing the IMF tells a debtor country is to raise taxes on uh, income taxes on labor, uh, land, and industry. Uh, but uh, so when Argentina and Brazil and other countries do this, the taxes they raise are in their domestic currency, escudos or pesos or whatever, and they still have to convert these into dollars. And raising taxes does not help them uh, get the dollars to pay the foreign debts at all. So the IMF is giving them bad advice. They know it's bad advice. They know it's junk advice. That's why they give it to them. It's junk advice that helps the United States because the junk advice that uh, debtor countries are told to do destroys their economy and lets American investors come in and take them over. Uh, so this is uh, dollar colonialism and it's done without gunboats. Gun and it's done because countries willingly say, well, uh, the American dollar system seems to be the only natural system, so we're going to go along with it. 
And this is what has to be changed if the world is to avoid going into a permanent uh, depression. Now, attempts to pay Europe's unpayably high debts after World War I, we saw what the result uh, was. It was all in vain. They couldn't pay. Uh, and Keynes uh, uh, showed in the 1920s that unless the Allies ag agreed to buy German exports, there was no way for Germany and the Reichsbank to uh, earn the dollars to pay the reparations to the, U to the European allies to pay uh, their inter allied debt and dollars still back to the United States. Uh, and yet the IMF and US foreign diplomacy today are still following the same disastrous policies that led to war and uh, a breakup of Europe uh, after World War I. They're still imposing fiscal austerity and asset set, uh, sell offs. And the only uh, consequence can be to further destabilize and impoverish countries in these uh, countries. So this austerity policy is now being imposed on the US economy itself because the, uh, the US has developed an economic doctrine telling other countries to obey the US. And since this doctrine is the only uh, theory that's taught in schools, uh, American economists actually believe that that's how the U.S. should be run. You pay the debt of the U.S. has become so heavily indebted and debt leveraged that uh, it believes that the way to uh, uh, make the economy grow to pay off the debt is to raise taxes and impoverish labor all the more. Well, of course, by impoverishing uh, labor and industry with more taxes, it's even harder to repay uh, uh, the debt that they've run, out, run up. And so America is now beginning to uh, look like a third world country imposing on itself for the first time the same disastrous policies that it's imposed on the third world, which is why the US is deindustrializing rapidly. Not slowly, it's falling off a cliff uh, uh, so rapidly. So the main battle going on today with regard to the diplomacy of dollar hegemony is that every country needs foreign exchange reserves. Every country needs to pay other countries when it imports from them or when it uh, invests in them or when it sends profit to investors. Now, dollar reserves are US uh, debt uh, run up by the military and uh, you don't want that. Uh, even foreign countries that do not approve of the combination of US military spending abroad and the takeover of foreign assets must face the fact that if they don't recycle their dollars, then their currencies will rise against the dollar. The only thing they can do to protect their markets is to do what America did to Germany in 1923. It had the depreciating currency uh, tariff, a floating tariff, so that as a currency like the dollar depreciates, the tariff against uh, American uh, exports will automatically rise to prevent American exports from uh, underselling uh, exports that are competitive of you. If the US dollar falls and that makes uh, grain and soybeans cheaper to China, well, more power than fine, let it fall. But you don't want, uh, you, you don't want UX uh, you, or, yes, or dollar area industrialists to undersell Chinese industrialists. Uh, you want to do uh, to other countries exactly what the United States did uh, towards uh, Germany and Europe after World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to pr uh, protect yourself from depreciating currencies, uh, and uh, that's uh, the dollar's solution to everything under the kind of chunk economics uh, that it uh, uh, teaches in the schools. So the question is, how, what's the alternative to paper dollars? Uh, and the path of resistance that's taken by Russia, China, and uh, some of the other payment surplus nations is to de-dollarize uh, by buying gold, you, uh, you, using their dollar inflows to, uh, to buy up gold. Uh, because gold is one of the few, everybody can agree that it's objective metal. It's an asset without having a debt attached to it. You can buy gold without financing US military spending around your borders. You can buy gold and it just sits there as an asset. You're not funding your adversaries. And uh, holding dollars is to fund a nation that has declared that uh, China is an adversary and that Russia is an adversary. So of course, uh, you don't buy, you don't want to finance the government of a country that's going to war with you. America is going to war with China and Russia financially, economically, and in trade, and almost militarily. 
it's making pro of its military right now. So for third world debtor countries, the problem is also, how do you avoid letting foreign debt destroy their economies? Well, you, you have to say, uh, we are just, we're not going to pay the debts. There was, just as there was in 1931, a moratorium on uh, inter-allied debts and German reparations, we demand a moratorium on third world debts uh, for the time being to avoid mass third world poverty. That's the choice, just as it was a choice back in 1931. So in the end, debt write downs and outright debt write-offs are the only solution. And uh, this needs to be written into the uh, logic of international law. No country should be forced to destroy its economy to pay foreign creditors. That, that's a tributary demand, a demand for trivia, and it's an act of war. And uh, in fact, such demands in the past could only be imposed by military conquest. Uh, today, they're being imposed by financial conquest, and that's just as destructive, taking into account the decline in population that results from shortening lifespans, rising suicide rates, and integration. Uh, intellectual conquest is an equally important dimension, and the most important neo, uh, intellectual con uh, conquest was uh, that of uh, Russia, uh, Yeltsin's Russia. Uh, the economy was impoverished by shock therapy that Russia was uh, leaders were uh, persuaded to impose on itself. America said, you'll get rich on no time. Well, what happened uh, is that instead of growing, the economy was uh, uh, bankrupted uh, deliberately. Uh, the, uh, the economy was turned over to uh, Western representatives, domestic kleptocrats, and uh, the population shrank, suicide rates rose, and uh, uh, the, uh, the economy spiraled downward until finally, uh, uh, President Putin came in and uh, stabilized matters. So does, the destruction was both financial and intellectual, not military. America didn't have to go to war to make to uh, uh, make uh, 10 million uh, Russians die. More than uh, Germany had to go to war to kill almost as many Russians in World War II. America did it simply by intellectual conquest. And so dollar diplomacy uh, was a lever that went together with neoliberal economics, Washington consensus, and the kind of junk economics that uh, uh, is taught in American colleges. So ultimately an issue at all this are the criteria for nationhood. What does it mean to be an independent nation? Uh, US and IMF financial diplomacy rejects the basic principle of international relations that were established uh, by the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia that uh, ended Europe's uh, uh, 30 years war. Uh, that principle of international law, 1648, proclaimed that nations should not interfere in the government or politics or religion of other nations. And what was at issue was the ultimate choice, either political and economic independence, being in control of one's own destiny by preventing uh, foreign interference or affairs, or you surrender and submit uh, to uh, along the lines of uh, today's financial market choice, your money or your life. Now, at the time in 1648, Pope uh, Innocent X denounced the Treaty of Westphalia and refused to accept the principle of international law. Uh, the United States today is also insisting that it should be exempt from any foreign international rules. It, it rejects any international law that will put other countries uh, 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 in charge of their own own faith. So uh, in contrast to their insistence, uh, to the US insistence on total US independence, US diplomats demand political and economic submission by other countries. They insist that the United States alone should dictate the economic policies and political policies and alliances of all other countries, removing elected leaders who advocate policies that don't serve America's Cold War aims, as uh, we've seen in Latin America again and again. Uh, the U.S. demands uh, 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 and the U.S. ability to make this a demand for control is what makes it the exceptional country uh, and also exceptional as uh, its insistence that the U.S. has to be uh, the gainer. That uh, multilateral trade agreements are not for mutual gain. They are for to be for U.S. gain. And uh, that uh, demand for a unipolar world and unipolar U.S. benefit rejects 
the traditional norms of equity and symmetry that were in place in 1648. And so what's, what's at stake is the whole direction the world will go in. Uh, and US diplomatic speeches usually describe their policies uh, and end by citing a sanctimonious uh, biblical quote. So I'd like to end this lecture with a quote from the Christian father Lactantius. He uh, lived from about 250 to 325. Uh, and his Divine Institutes, written toward uh, the end of his uh, life in 325, he wrote, in order to enslave the many, the greedy began to appropriate and accumulate the necessities of life and keep them tightly closed up so that they might keep these bounties for themselves. They did this not for humanity's sake, which was not in them at all, but to rake up all things and products of their greed and avarice. In the name of justice, they made unfair and unjust laws to sanction their thefts and avarice against the power of the multitude. In this way, they availed as much by the authority as by strength of arms and overt evil. And Lactantius was describing the Roman Empire when he wrote those words, but his description might just as well describe uh, that of the United States and indeed uh, the inherent dynamic of uh, the American-centered finance capitalism. Mm -hmm.